Welcome to the Produce Moms Podcast, where we believe there is a produce mom in all of us. I'm Lori Taylor, founder and CEO of the Produce Moms. For 10 years, I sold fresh produce to over 300 grocery stores in the U.S. And today, my team and I are fully focused on inspiring people to eat more fruits and vegetables. This show is just one of the ways that we hope to inspire you and your family to eat more produce and live a better life. If you like what you're hearing on the podcast, join our community of almost 40,000 in all 50 states and over 30 countries by visiting theproducemoms.com slash subscribe. And be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for being here. Enjoy today's show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Produce Moms podcast. My name is Lori Taylor, and I am so proud to be your host. And today we have the most amazing guest. Uh, I absolutely love this woman and her work. She was Her work was actually brought to our attention by one of our amazing Produce Moms fans and podcast listeners. So Casey, thank you so much for telling us about Dr. Yami. Dr. Yami is our guest today. She is a Yakima, uh, Washington-based physician. She is in private practice focused on pediatrics. In addition to that, like that would be, that already is an incredible uh, impact and, and career. But in addition to that, she is an author, she's a podcast host, Uh, Dr. Yami is a health coach, and she is a mom. You can find her website, VeggieFitKids.com, and I am so excited to welcome her to our show today. Dr. Yami, thank you for being here. Lori, thank you so much for having me. This is super fun, and I can't wait to talk more to your audience and talk more about eating veggies. Yeah, this is going to be great. And you you just have such a unique um, perspective here because so many of the things that we stand for at the Produce Moms really define who you are as a professional, as well as who you are as a, as a human being and a mom. And this is, and like I said, uh, it always makes my heart sing when one of our followers says, Hey, you need to meet this person They're They are mission aligned with what's happening at the Produce Moms. And Dr. Yami and I have had the opportunity to talk a couple times. Um, and I have an episode on her podcast. Podcast coming up as well. So I look forward to sharing that with you all. But um, gosh, this is going to be a great show. Your work, um, your work and the Produce Moms work, to say it's mission aligned would be maybe the understatement of the, mm-hmm. of the year. It's, uh, it's definitely, we are women who uh, march to the beat of the same drum, that's for sure. So Dr. Yami, let's just get started with a basic introduction. Please tell us more about your background, uh, and how you developed this amazing passion to bring, make veggies and children such a part of your, of your life goal. Sure. Well, I had wanted to be a doctor since I was barely walking and talking from the age of four. I declared that I wanted to be a doctor. I was inspired by my aunt who was a general practitioner in Panama at the time, and I wanted to be just like her. And so it was pretty much my life mission to become a doctor. But I wanted to become a doctor because I wanted to help people. And along the way through medical school, that's when I realized I wanted to focus on pediatrics. And as we know, in pediatrics, pediatrics is really great because we focus on prevention. So we give immunizations, we make sure that kids are growing healthy, we watch out for diseases, we try to prevent them, you know? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was seeing is that my patients weren't so healthy, but it wasn't like they were getting all of these chronic diseases as bad as adults, but it it seemed that they were getting them too early. So, you know, their their dietary choices were causing them to not feel well, chronic abdominal pain, lots of allergies, and just Overall, they're just not feeling well. This wasn't right for for pediatrics. And so that's when I wanted to kind of open up my education. And it was along the same time that I myself discovered not only plant-based nutrition, but I also learned about intuitive eating and not following this sort of diet mindset that we have in the United States. And that kind of just opened opened up my whole world, changed my paradigm. I learned about the difference between whole foods and processed foods, which is 
a much more easy and simpler way to look at food rather than counting calories or counting macros and, and all of these things. And then I learned about lifestyle medicine, which I'm now a certified lifestyle medicine physician as well. But I feel like now I finally have the tools to help children along a healthy path. And when I am at my office seeing patients, when I'm coaching, when I'm with my own children, I have three main goals. The first one is I want them to feel good. So I want to support their well-being. And this is beyond health because we all have different levels of health that we're either born with or we can develop conditions that are no, no fault to us during our life. So just anybody, whatever their health status is, can strive for well-being. So I want to support and encourage well-being in all my patients, my children, myself. Number two is to try to obtain health but also decrease chronic disease and increase longevity. So living a mm -hmm. long, healthy life. But the third one is, which I think a lot of us don't think about and gets missed, is to support and encourage food and body confidence. Mm -hmm. I really want my patients, I want my children, I want myself, I want to feel good about the choices I'm making and I want to feel confident in my body. I don't want to be worrying all the time about losing that extra 10 pounds or not looking right. I want to just be confident in those choices. And so now that's kind of what drives me and I've just been honing down on how to help people embrace and adopt a more whole food, whole plant food diet. It doesn't have to be exclusively a plant food diet, but how can we get more whole plant foods and how can we start adopting more of the lifestyle pillars so that we can have these things while well, being health and food and body confidence? Yeah, absolutely. Well, to sit, your tagline, pediatrician on a mission, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that kind of brings it full circle right there. Everything you just explained, it's so important. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, you're, you're really our first guest, Dr. Yami, that has, has focused on intuitive eating. I mean, mm -hmm. we have not done a full, a full broadcast on that topic. I know you're mm -hmm. passionate about it. It's the, it's the title of your book. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. What does it even mean and why, what led you to become so passionate about it? Well, of course it's just personal experience. And I think a right. lot of things that we learn in life we learn it because we've gone through our own pain and then we come out on the other side and we want to help other people either avoid pain or make it through that pain quicker, you know? So I, unfortunately, from a young age, started dieting. And my first diet was around eight or nine years old. And I stayed on that diet roller coaster for a few decades. And with that diet roller coaster came extreme body dissatisfaction, body image problems, and disordered eating. And it really interfered with my life. It interfered with my well being, it interfered with my mental health. And I think it stole a few years away from productivity. I don't want to make my whole life about being productive, but I am a person that can get a lot of stuff done. But I spent so many years focusing on trying to be thinner, trying to lose weight, trying to look a certain way that it really just changed my focus of my life, took attention away from other things that I think were more important. So, like I said before, when I discovered plant-based nutrition along the same time, I was working with a coach that helped me learn about intuitive eating and a non-diet approach to feel good, choose the food that helped me feel good, and give up that diet mentality. Mm -hmm. The term intuitive eating was initially created by the authors of the main book called Intuitive Eating. So they're, they're the original intuitive eating people. So that's Elise Resch and Evelyn Triboli. And their book just got released, the fourth edition, I believe. So this has been around since the 80s. And I took it and I wanted to apply it to children. They talk, they definitely, in their book, they talk about children, they talk about families. But I think that starting from the beginning and supporting children who are born naturally intuitive eaters 
is would be so fantastic if we can help encourage parents to allow their children to stay intuitive eaters that would be fantastic so what it means to me the way i simplify it for the pediatric population is just honoring hunger and satiety and what happens is when our kids become toddlers or preschool age, they're way more interested in life. They Their main job is to play and explore and discover the world around them. So they don't really want to sit down and have long, luxurious European style meals. You know what I'm saying? They just want to sit down. Sure. They want to take a few bites, not be hungry anymore and move on with their lives. But this really causes a lot of anxiety for parents. And so what happens then is that parents start encouraging their children to eat more, or you can't have this until you have this. You know, we start doing some bribing, we start doing some encouraging, different things like that. And those little strategies slowly start to chip away at our child's natural intuitive ability to feed themselves when they're hungry and stop when they're satisfied. So I wrote a book so that I can help guide parents, support them, help relieve some of their anxieties when it comes to their children's eating. And of course, it gets a little bit more complicated than that, but that's how I see it in the simplest terms. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, and a term that I think uh, anyone who spends time like on Instagram say, a term that I feel like is rising in popularity or, or, or a concept rather is the no diet diet. Mm-hmm. Is it the same as intuitive eating? Well, I think we can fall into a trap <laughs> because in our country and in a lot of places around the world now, we are really focused on the size and shape of our bodies. And because of that, we're desperately seeking some solution to lose weight, a lot of people, you know? So what the trap is, is when people start using intuitive eating to change the size and shape of their bodies, and it has nothing to do with that. So some people that have been yo-yo dieting a lot, binging, because one thing that happens with restriction, which is what a lot of diets are, is that some people start binging and overeating, and then they think they're food addicts and you know all these things happen. So whenever they find intuitive eating and start tuning into their bodies, some people may actually lose weight. Some people may actually gain weight because they have been restricting for so long and over-focusing on calories and portions for so long that when they actually start to pay attention to their bodies, their bodies are like, actually, my natural size is larger than what you have tried to make me by doing all of this restriction. So intuitive eating is not about trying to change the size and shape of your body. And that's one of the concepts that I teach parents is that really when it comes to body size, a lot of that is genetically determined. And that might be disappointing for a lot of mothers to hear because we want our children to be socially acceptable. And one of the ways to be socially acceptable that we think in our country is for our children to be a certain body size. Mm -hmm. But what we do have control over is the habits and behaviors that we can promote that we can encourage in our household. And we can do that by supporting intuitive eating, trusting our children when they're hungry and when they're satisfied and not forcing food on them, not restricting their food, but also offering wholesome, whole foods, an abundance of plants and really good habits in our homes. Yeah, definitely. So when you were talking about the, the, the three different pillars, uh, the one that I wrote down is food and body confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm raising boys and mm -hmm. it's amazing to me how even with my boys, I thought that food and body confidence was something that uh, affected disproportionately affected women or only mm -hmm. affected women, frankly, mm -hmm. is what I thought until mm -hmm. I started raising boys and realized that my, my boys, one of which is a preteen and the other who is now 10, uh, they deal with it. You yes. know, the, and, and I would love to get, uh, go a little bit deeper on that topic, um, you know, for our listeners today and, and maybe pull some of your experience from whether it's research or your clinical work and your private pediatrics practice or the work that you've done, uh, in health coaching, uh, and, and, and of course your personal experiences and passions as well. But I think it's really 
um, it's such an important topic. And as social media is so in the face of the children, I mean, th- these are new as a parent, that is a, that is a, that's a challenge, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that I'm dealing with that my mom didn't have to deal with when she was raising me. Um, and I'm, and I'm certain that every single one of your patients who has, you know, every single one of your patients that is around the same age as my children, that, that you start to see that impact of the social media and how it can, how it can really affect food and body confidence for our children. So any, any thoughts or research yes. that you'd like to share? Thanks. Yes, there is a lot. <laughs> there is an I abundance. Bet. How I much bet. time do you have? <laughs> I, know. I know. But we'll, we'll just start with my personal experience because I, like you, am a boy mom. So my boys are 10 and 15 years old. And I had to discover it my own way as well. My eldest, when he was around six, started sucking in his stomach and started to do a lot of what they call body checking. So body checking is something that I'm sure women are very familiar with. It's when we are constantly looking at ourselves in the mirror, seeing, you know, how how does my butt look in these jeans? How does my stomach look? Are my thighs too big? Are my arms too flabby? And just doing that compulsively. So he started doing compulsive body checking and he was only six years old. Now, the studies are showing that by the time children are five, they already know what a diet is. They already know what it's for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you you talk about girls and, and it is true. Women are more affected than boys. But as we both can see, it doesn't just affect girls. It affects both boys and girls. And we are living in an even more challenging environment because especially kids that have access to social media, it greatly affects their body image. And so we know that when children and when teens spend more time on social media, they are likely going to have poor body image. They're going to feel bad about themselves. They're going to be dissatisfied. And these are the kids that will eventually try out dieting and dieting, like I said, is a roller coaster. You go on it, you restrict, binge, and then it, it also leads to disordered eating or dangerous eating practices. You know, yeah. when they start getting into the pills, the diuretics, or, you know, some of these things you can find online like teas and over exercise and lots of things like that. So we yeah. know that this is happening early, but it's not just social media because a lot of these studies were done before we had the advent of, you know, this explosion of social media and kids having access to it. So it really does start in our homes. And I don't like to guilt or shame anybody because believe me, I'm in the same boat and I was exactly like every other person, you know, in this country that I spent a lot of time making disparaging remarks about my own body. So we have to Mm. really watch our language. So one of the things I talk about in my book is to have a positive environment. When I talk about a positive environment, I'm referring not just to the food we have on our house. We want to, like you talk about with, you know, the produce moms, fill our homes with an overabundance of beautiful, colorful fruits and vegetables and beans and all of those things. But we also, in our home environment, want to talk positively or at least least avoid negative language about our bodies. And if we can't do that, just be neutral. Let's not even talk about bodies or body size because for some people going from like, I hate my butt, my butt's too big. I need to lose weight. I'm so fat. I'm so disgusting. You know, these are common things I used to say all the time. So I know that other people are saying it in their houses. So if you can't go from that to, I love my body, which most people are not going to be able to go to. And I understand at least don't say anything and try not to have a bunch of magazines out that are talking about the latest diet and lose 10 pounds and, you know, get bikini ready for the summer and just be very conscious of what TV you're watching, you know, because all of that is your environment and our children are learning by watching us. We are so important to Mm -hmm. what they believe and what they think about themselves. So if they see us saying, I hate my body, I'm not good enough to go to the beach because my body's too large or whatever, 
then they're going to be thinking about that themselves as well. So we Mm -hmm. have to be very careful. And from the beginning, try to if we can't be neutral, if we can't be positive, at least be neutral about our bodies. Mm, that's great advice. What uh, what kind of advice do you have for parents where households where mom and dad are not struggling with their body image, but they see that their children are? What's yes. the right What's the right uh, first step for households in this scenario? Well, I think we should talk about it. I don't think that we should avoid the subject altogether. I think we just have to be careful with how we talk about it. Children's bodies change their whole lives until they're adults, right? So they their the, their body shape changes as they become toddlers and preschoolers. They start to stretch out. They lose that toddler tummy. But then when they're right before puberty, a lot of children actually put on body fat. So they go through the stage, which, you know, the junior high stage, which can be awkward for a lot of kids. Yeah. And it's important to talk to them about it. You know, like, hey, your body is changing. Your hormones are changing changing. I am very specific with girls because especially girls that are really lean and very thin when they're younger, as their hormones start to change, I tell them, hey, you're going to put fat around your hips. You're going to put fat around your breasts. Your body is going to change and this is normal and this is natural. This is your genetic blueprint. This Mm -hmm. is your body saying what it's going to do. And of course, we want to support healthy habits. We want to make sure we're eating wholesome foods and exercising and sleeping and keeping our stress low. But I just want kids to know that what their body is doing is it's not something that they're supposed to be trying to change, you know? But it's important to talk about I definitely discourage families from trying to put their children on diets or restricting their foods or being like, you can't eat that, you can't eat that, because that is one of those things that can trigger that disordered eating. Mm -hmm. It's more about as a family, if you know that, you know, especially during this quarantine period, you know, we've gotten to this quarantine snacking habit, right? Well, how can we change that? Either let's try to emphasize more fruits and vegetables for snacks or have more defined scheduled eating times. Let's go for walks as a family, those kinds of things, because those are things we have control over, but our bodies are going to do what our bodies are going to do. Yeah. But, so and that's you know, why I discuss it that way with families. Yeah. It's, it's so great that um, you've emerged as such a leading resource for parents everywhere, not just in Washington state, but um, Dr. Yami, what about the scenario where, uh, I mean, childhood obesity is so on the rise. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the climate that so many of our households are living in right now, um, you know, it's, it's, there's not, there's not much that's happening in these kids' lives that are going to uh, help mitigate the risk for, for obesity. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got to think you've got schools shut down. Uh, physical activity is limited still in many parts of, of the country. Uh, youth sports are on the fritz in many places are completely shut down. Um, so share more on what you want people to know. Any parent who's listening right now, who is thinking, man, I, you know, they know that you, they know that they are, that their child is struggling with childhood obesity. Uh, Mm -hmm. what, what do you want them to know right now? Okay. Well, thank you for asking me this because this is very important. And first of all, I just send so much love and compassion to all Mm -hmm. of these parents because I know that it's a difficult spot to be in. But the first thing I want these parents to do is shake off this feeling of guilt uh, Mm. and shame about it. Because what happens is when we have these negative feelings, we get anxiety, we, then we start trying to force things to happen. (laughs) And whenever we do that, it can backfire on us. Just like I was talking about the food restriction. So a lot of parents, when they're in this situation, they get comments from family members, they get comments from the pediatrician, from the child's doctor, like you need to do something about this, you know? Mm -hmm. And then 
it can get to the point where it's restrictive or there's other counterproductive strategies that are used. So the first thing is let's shake off the guilt and the shame and let's get into action mode. What are the things we can control? Mm -hmm. It is a difficult time. And I will admit that sometimes there's going to be families that have more privilege than others that have more control over some of these things than others that have more access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And I know that you're part of helping, you know, people have more access because that's what we need is more access. But what are the small steps we can take? Don't try to overhaul everything at once. But if you see that your child is sedentary and spending a lot of time in front of the tablet or the TV, can you start with them even just 10 minutes a day? Let's get up and let's dance together with some music on. Let's march in place. Let's put on this video and you know do these cool animal moves that we found. So just little steps over time that are sustainable for you and your family is what's going to get you there. It's not going to be like this huge dramatic overnight change that you can only do for like a few days or a week. And then you just go back to the old way. Yeah. So good. Uh, and I love that. I love that your first piece of advice is shed the guilt. I think yes. that is just so important for anyone listening today that can, you know, where this episode is pulling at your heartstrings. Uh, I hope that that's your primary takeaway here. Cause that is, that is just the freedom to take real action is to shed the guilt first. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that's great. So Dr. Yami, um, let's, let's talk about, um, I mean, the, Let's talk about plant-based. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I loved how in your previous remarks and in your website, veggiefitkids.com, but in your previous remarks, it's plant, you know, a plant forward diet is always a, a good thing or a plant forward lifestyle is probably the better choice you've taught me um, of words, but where, where do people begin? Uh, you know, one thing that I always, before you share your remarks, one thing that I always tell people, and I'd love to know, um, what you tell folks in your private practice and in your health coach work. Um, A lot of people will let us know, Hey, I'm here at the produce moms. I'm following along with your social media or subscribe to your content because I can't get my, my children interested in fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. And what we always tell them is, you know, I, I love your concept of shed the guilt. We always say, don't overthink it. Okay. If your kids, cause I've done this in my own personal life, my, my son's like, I I struggle to get them to eat vegetables specifically Mm -hmm. in volume and variety. They, they will eat like my son, Mac will eat fresh raw carrots, all day, every day. And that's the only vegetable he will ever ask for. And it's the only vegetable when I put it on his plate, he will consume the whole serving. My son, Joe is the same way with cucumbers. (laughs) So I always tell people like, I don't really overthink it. I just continue to make sure that the carrots and the cucumbers are always in, you know, are always available. And then I slowly add in tastes of new varieties Mm -hmm. and, and, and encourage the boys taste it. Like you don't have to love everything you taste. We all have our favorite things. And, you know, just try new things though. Um, but what, what's your tips? Um, yes. I know there's a, an abundant amount of them at veggiefitkids.com, mm-hmm. but today on the podcast, share, share a couple, st- you know, launching pad steps that parents can take because so many of us, this is what connects so many of us parents. Yes. Uh, it's, you know, that we all are struggling with this. Well, one thing that I want everybody to take away from this podcast episode is that the only way to learn to like a food is through consistent and repetitive exposure. That Mm. is the only way. We are not born loving anything except for maybe breast milk. Thank goodness, because otherwise it wouldn't work out so well in those first few days of life. So Mm -hmm. pretty much we have a preference for the flavor of breast milk, but beyond that, everything is learned and it can be learned at any point of your life. It's never too late, but of course, the earlier we start exposing our children to these flavors, the better, including during pregnancy, which is why I encourage pregnant moms to start eating an abundance of different plant foods because the fetus can actually start tasting when it's a few weeks of life through the amniotic fluid. Some of the flavors come through the amniotic fluid. 
And also during breastfeeding, during lactation, some of the flavors that mom is eating is coming through the breast milk. So repetitive, repetitive, consistent exposure, keep exposing your child to it. But then the next key is don't force. So you, your job, and this is the Ellen Satter's division of responsibilities. There is roles that the parent has, there are roles that the child has. So the role of the parent is that they get to decide what, where, and when. So what are they going to serve, when they're going to serve it, and in what place, so where they're going to be, where they're going to be sitting. You know, it's going to be in sitting at the table, we're going to have black beans and rice and broccoli, and it's going to be at noon today, you know? But then Mm -hmm. after that, your job is over. You give the food to the child, and then the child decides if and how much. So are they going to even taste the black beans today, or are they going to go for the rice and the broccoli only? Or maybe you put the broccoli on that plate 15 or 20 times before finally the child's like, you know what, today I feel like taking a little lick or sniff of this or, you know, doing something with it. But I think what happens is that parents, they expose their child to that broccoli that one time the child turns their nose up, or maybe they do taste it and they make this horrible face. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're like, Oh, that's, I hate it. You know? (laughs) And then the parents like, okay, I'm never going to give you that again. You know? And so it's over. They got like one chance, Mm -hmm. but we know as adults that, we learn to like the craziest things. How did we learn to like those things? It's because we kept tasting it. Like I think of things like coffee, like that is so bitter, you know, and people love (laughs) coffee, alcohol, like also the flavor is very, very strong. You know, things like sauerkraut and some of these super spicy things, we if we would have only tasted it one time, we probably would have never, you know, kept doing it. But we we had motivation to like that food for whatever reason. So we kept trying it until we finally had a preference for it. So it's the same for our children. So I just want everybody to know that it's never too late to learn to like a food, but you have to do it with repetition. You have to be just really repetitive about it, but then let go of the outcome, you know, like don't feel like you're a failure because your child never eats broccoli. That's fine. It's just like your kids, you know, the, that you know that they have the carrots and the cucumbers down and you're not going to go around feeling like you're a failure because they're not eating every single vegetable. So I think that's the main thing that I want parents to know about that. And then just like I said before, it's going to be these small habits. Just keep making these foods, keep trying new things yourself because we're role models. So if you have a very restrictive diet and you tell your kids, I don't like vegetables or I don't like all these things, then you're not providing them with that example that they can learn from. So parents themselves sometimes have to work on their own consumption of fruits and vegetables so that they can be a role model for their children. Mm Mm-hmm. So true. 100% true. And for more tips, I encourage everyone to visit Veggie Fit Kids uh, online. You can, again, veggiefitkids.com. Uh, definitely check out Dr. Yami's book. The title of Dr. Yami's book is Intuitive Eating. It's a parent's guide to intuitive eating, how to raise kids who love to eat healthy that just sounds like freedom, right? (laughs) I mean, it just sounds like what we all want. Every produce mom out there, that's what we want. Uh, So Dr. Yami, it's been a real pleasure hearing more about all of your passions and the great work that you do. Uh, Just truly appreciate it. And I'm so thankful that Casey has made, you know, brought, brought to my attention, the great work you're doing. So Casey, thank you for that. If you're listening today. And, uh, I think that my biggest takeaway for this episode for everyone listening is absolutely surrounding the food and body confidence. It really Mm -hmm. resonated with me and, you know, uh, was something that I, I wasn't expecting to be such a concern for my young boys, but, um, it's really important. And I certainly look to, uh, Dr. Yami as an expert in this space. And I look forward to continuing to get that encouragement from her, both, uh, through her website and social media presence, as well as through her podcast. So, uh, Dr. Yami with that, I just want to say thank you. And I'll throw the mic back to you for our final goodbye. Any closing thoughts that you might have, and we'll, you can sign us off from today's show. 
All right. Thank you so much, Lori. And I just want to tell all the moms and dads out there that you're doing a fantastic job. So give yourself some credit, give yourself some grace, and just keep exposing your children to the fruits and vegetables and beans and all of those health-promoting foods. But then let go of the outcome. Just do the best you can and have fun. Feeding our kids and feeding ourselves should be fun. It should not be stressful. So if you're stressing out, I want you to kind of like, let that go, do your best and keep taking one step after another. I believe in you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Produce Moms podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a featured guest, just send an email to Lori at theproducemoms.com. We know there is a produce mom in you because there's a produce mom in all of us. Join our community on Facebook and all social platforms. Help us change the way America eats. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time.